Hello everyone and welcome to The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am your host for uh, this procession of ghoulish goings on. And today is a very special episode. One, because it's kind of a crossover episode, uh, by which I mean I am reaching out to all of the people who uh, continue to support Hero Hero Go Show, which is the Asian horror podcast that I've done. That is now officially going to be part of the Dark Parade. I hope to be doing one Asian horror related podcast a month, uh, depends on the series that we're in. But that's the plan, and certainly several episodes of uh, The Dark Parade will be devoted to Asian horror in one form or another. So if you have been subscribed to Hero Hero Go Show, first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm very proud of the show. Um, we are going to be uh, releasing those episodes on this feed as well, kind of over time. We're going to dole that stuff out. But uh, please, uh, subscribe to The Dark Parade where you will get all the uh, the new stuff. So yeah, so that that's a bit of housekeeping out of the way. But more importantly, it, this is kind of a return to stuff I really like, but also an unusual example of uh, Asian horror. This is a, a film from Japan from 1971. Um, it is sort of on the heels of the Hammer films in Japan wanting to try their hand at that. And the only person that I feel like I would want to discuss this with is someone who loves both of those things, uh, and that is Don and Ellie, and he is here uh, on this episode to discuss the vampire doll, uh, the gothic influences of it, the stuff that we kind of really love about the gothic influences of it, and uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it. I really had a great time having this conversation. There is a, a bit of a footnote here that there were some audio issues while we were recording uh, this particular episode. I hope that they will be invisible, uh, but please understand that if you hear occasionally my voice bleeding through a little bit on Don's end of things, uh, that is something I tried to clean up to the best of my ability, but if you hear it here and there, uh, apologies, and uh, and it should not be distracting. Hopefully, uh, you know, it's bad enough you got to listen to my voice once, but uh, twice, why that's too much. Uh, by a, a factor of one, if you ask me. So, <laughs> that out of the way, uh, like I said, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. For the Hero Hero Go Show listeners, uh, be sure you join us on the Dark Parade at wherever you get your podcasts so that you will continue to get more discussion of Asian horror. And I plan to do uh, more of it on a regular basis. So, that is it for now. And uh, enjoy the conversation. I'll uh, talk to you on the other side. So as promised, everyone, and and certainly not the first time I've said this, uh, with me is uh, one of one of my favorites and and an expert, one uh, might say, in the world of Asian horror, and um, has has currently uh, got his own new show happening. So, uh, with me, uh, graciously is Don and Ellie. Thanks for being here and, uh, tell people a little bit, uh, about the show. Ah, uh, well, uh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, great to be back. So, uh, the show is called, uh, the Horror Countdown Podcast. Um, I, I just launched it, uh, about a month ago is the time of we're recording this. Um, as the title says, it's basically just a list show. Um, instead of doing reviews or interviews or, you know, anything like that, it's basically just pick a topic, uh, count down 10 of your favorites, and uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, basically, you know, I just get somebody on, we pick a topic, and uh, count down our choices. So Devious. Yeah, um, I, I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, definitely had some uh, interesting lists, some interesting guests. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, really excited about it and uh, looking to see where it's uh, going to go from here. Excellent. Well, uh, the reason that uh, I wanted to do this particular episode with you is, as I said, you, I, you and I are both uh, fans, aficionados, um, uh, intrigued by uh, Asian horror, and this is one of a, a trilogy, uh, the first in a trilogy of movies done by Tohu Studios, uh, who, you know, maybe the, the biggest genre studio in Japan, one would think, considering all the, the kaiju films and so forth. 
Yeah, uh, um, I yeah, I think between the two of us, it's uh, one of the most uh, recognizable names, I would say. Yeah, and so this movie um, is uh, uh, the Vampire Doll, and we'll get in uh, on the back end of this. I'll talk a little bit about why this movie was made, but it is very much Toho Studios pivoting and doing uh, a little bit of a hammer riff uh although kind of late now like hammer had been doing it for you know a decade plus by the time vampire doll rolled along uh which is from 71 and uh, but it is it is very much them kind of doing that thing and when you talk about like oh toho studios famous for a series of kaiju films and and you know weird genre stuff and that kind of thing is now going to do a fairly well in theory a traditional vampire film um it doesn't sound like it would work at least to me yeah um there's a couple um it it, it actually has kind of a rather unique take where Asian cinema doing a European and specifically British gothic horror film 10 years after the fact by a studio that specializes in uh, monster movie kaiju fare. It, it kind of, in essence, it sounds like it should be, you know, it could either be great or it can just be a colossal train wreck. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And in this case, fortunately for all involved, uh, you know, slight spoilers, as if uh, the show was not predicated on such things, um, you know, it turns out it's a really fascinating movie. So, uh, but let's let's dive into this. Uh, as, as always, ladies and gentlemen, um, we will be starting off with a, a brief look at the plot. Obviously, spoilers will abound if you haven't seen the movie. And, um, and it starts off in typical gothic fashion on kind of a dark and stormy night as uh, a, a guy named Sagawa is driving into the countryside to the estate of the girl that he intends to marry. He is coming back from uh, the United States and hasn't heard from her. And so is driving to her, her family home so that he can find out a what's going on with her and B uh, intends to marry her. And uh, he, he gets there, uh, you know, with some trouble because the guy driving the taxi uh, is having trouble finding the place during the storm. And again, incredibly gothic. It is, you know, straight yeah. up lightning flashes and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I'm almost surprised that there's not a, uh, you know, caretaker popping up behind a tree with a lantern, you know, watching him go by with that shifty look on his face. Yeah, I mean, not here, but we've definitely got that guy. There is yeah, that what I'm just saying, right, that I'm just saying is that, you know, we don't get him at the very beginning like we usually do. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, you're, it's, it just fits a trope of Hammer Studios like to a T. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so the, it turns out, like I said, he, you know, his fiance, uh, Yuko, is at this house and um they they find the mansion finally the the uh the home and uh so sagawa ends up knocking on the door and the, here's where we get our character guy a uh, guy named ginso ginso like opens up the door and he's got you know the bad eye and kind of a hunch and you know it, it's it is so close to young frankenstein um, uh, like that first introduction of Marty Feldman, it is right there. Uh, but I, I don't say that disparagingly. That is stuff I love. I love in the movie where you have a lightning strike and somebody like revealed in the shadows and that kind of stuff. And this is, you know, Ginso opening the door and, and, uh, it turns out he is both deaf and mute. However, and instead of Genso, uh, you know, getting the name of this guy, uh, Genso kind of just grabs him 
um, and, and, and wrestles them a little bit. And then we are introduced uh, to uh, Shidu, who is the mother who comes down this, this big gothic staircase and is like, Genzo, stop that at once. He is our guest, you know. Um, and her defining characteristic as we first see her is that she's got a big scar that runs across like the right side of her neck. Yeah, um, I, I initially, when I first saw this, I was actually thinking slight Kuchisaki Ona vibes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not quite that way, but I mean, that was kind of like the first instinct I had when I watched it, was that I was thinking that this was going to be like a riff on that. Like that was the vampire thing was like a Kuchisaki Ona kind of a vibe. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, well, we'll get into who the vampire is, but yeah, right, so yeah. Shidu... Um, is like, hey, I, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Yuko died a couple of weeks ago in a car accident, and she is not here. But given the storm going on outside, you can stay the night, and tomorrow, if you like, you can you can visit her grave. And uh, Sagawa, to his credit, is like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I haven't heard anything about this, but also, it's you know 1971 it's not like anybody had a cell phone and just nobody called him uh to let him know what was up until he showed up and um you know she do shows like oh here's this memorial that i have to yuko in my bedroom and he's he says the same thing that everybody in mourning says or when they find out that somebody they know has died which is like that's impossible i just saw her like the last time i saw her she was so happy and full of life and she was like, yeah, that's kind of how it works. Like, she was alive. Now she ain't. Sorry, man. Um, but yeah, so he is he is going... To, and and it, uh, the story is she was in a car accident. And there was a landslide. And, and she ended up going off the road and tumbling. And, and that, uh, that killed her. Um, but, Don, that night... As, as Sagawa is uh, pining for his now dead lover, uh, he hears a woman weeping. And, oh, I, man, I love this stuff so much. Like, I love gothic horror and the fact that it is in this, like, uniquely Japanese setting is kind of wonderful. Oh yeah, this this sequence is fantastic. Um, I mean, it's like he said, it's the pouring thunderstorm in the background. You've got him stuck in the house, you know, unsure of what's going on, and you hear the weeping just enough to where it's not necessarily sure if it's in his head or if he's actually legitimately hearing something, and it it just falls right into that gothic trope he grabs the candlelight and he goes wandering down the hallway with the curtains billowing in the wind oh it, it's fantastic i i was on board uh, right when this sequence came out this was like the the one that sold me on like I, it turning out from uh, being the train wreck i was expecting to being the full-fledged enjoyment piece that it actually is yeah yeah i i think you're right. i think you'll know in the first 10 minutes of this movie if this is a movie that's going to be for you. Uh, but yeah, it, I, I adore this. You're right. The billowing curtains and everything are just beautiful. It's so good. Uh, so yeah, he, he goes to this room, peeks through this keyhole uh, where he thinks he's hearing, you know, this, uh, this weeping. And he sees a woman all in white from behind rocking in a chair. And, uh, he you know busts open the door but suddenly no one is there and so he goes searching for the this woman who he thinks is yuko ends up opening up the door of this wardrobe out of which comes yuko only she is looking uh you know corpse like she's incredibly pale has this really great ghostly grin on her face it's uh it's quite good yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic shock. I, I really like it. And he pulls it off really well with the reveal. Because um, I initially was expecting it to be the mother playing the trick on him. And mm -hmm. then yeah, then you get the reveal that it's not her. And you get somebody else. And you get the fantastic shock. And yeah, 
the smile just sells it, and it, it's a really it's a really fun sequence. And it's you know, like yeah. I said, it's capped off by the you know fantastic setup to beforehand. So yeah, it, it works fantastic. Uh, so before he can, you know, rush into Yuko's arms, after realizing that it, it's her, uh, he gets conked on the head, and wakes up with uh, Shidu, the the mother, and Genzo, just hovering over him, and and the mother is like, "Hey, are you all right? Because, uh, you know, I saw you in the, or Genzo saw you in this room, and, um." you had passed out and he's like no 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 i saw yuko she's like oh well i'm afraid that's quite impossible tomorrow we'll go visit the grave and you can see for yourself she is she is absolutely gone um and you know he agrees to that he's calmed down enough but once he's led back to his room it's pretty clear that he doesn't buy this like he's pretty convinced that he saw yuko because in fact he did and so he he uh, he gets out of bed. He and he see, looks out the window, and there he sees Yuko once more, dressed in this you know flowing white gown, walking through the yard. And so he takes off running after her, and follows her all the way to, of course, the family graveyard, and with and and finds her grave, finds the grave of Yuko, but. Uh, he turns around and there is Yuko standing right in front of him. And he's like, oh, I knew you were alive. I, I know I knew you were okay. I knew I actually saw you. And he takes her hand and he's like, why, Yuko, your hand is so cold. And Yuko then does uh, almost that aliens kind of thing of like, you have to kill me. And he's like, "What are you talking about? Kill you? That you 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 must be sick. That's what's going on here. You're sick, and you uh, I'll I'll take care of you." And he embraces her, but when he does so, um, her eyes go uh, gold, and she gets the evil grin on her face again, and then uh, you know vampires out a little bit on him and and that's like our first sequence of this movie is this incredible you know almost jonathan jonathan harker-esque kind of move of like i'm going to the the castle of the vampire and yeah that i was that kind of thing yeah i was really thinking the same thing because it it really does have like a similar it, it does have a similar feel the lone guy going off to the you know castle you know the castle home of the vampire you know he's there on business he's you know there to meet her you know versus doing a business deal but like the same thing where he's not there expecting to see vampires and then he meets like the main one and then gets attacked and turned yeah i i had a really similar suspicion that it was kind of a riff on that take kind of you know done in a japanese style but yeah i i got really strong dracula vibes from that as well yeah, it, it's it's quite good, and and so as uh, Sagawa gets got by Yuko, there's a, like the quick cut to his sister Keiko waking up in her Tokyo apartment, screaming in fright, and uh, and Keiko uh, one presumes has had like some vision of of this happening in her dream. And she ends up uh, talking to her uh, boyfriend, a guy named Takagi. And uh, Takagi is like, hey, uh, we're both uh, off work today. How about we go for a drive? And uh, Keiko, the sister, is like, well, that sounds great. Also, my brother is missing at this secluded estate. How about we drive there and we'll go check on him? And Takagi is not totally down for this, but agrees to go because, you know, it was his dumb idea to take a drive. And now he's roped in because the sister is like, well, we need to make sure my brother's okay. And so off they go uh, to the Nonomura estate. And as they're driving to the house, they, they make a pit stop at a, um, 
a gas station. And while they're getting gassed up and asking for directions to this place, uh, the gas station attendant is like, oh, yeah, there's one road that will take you there. And boy, it's really a shame what happened to the daughter. You know, she died in this car accident. And uh, Hiroshi is like, oh, okay. Uh, Hiroshi Takagi is the guy's name. So Hiroshi is like, yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciate the information. We're going to take off. And so they leave. And as they go, Genzo shows up. And uh, the gas station attendant is like, oh, you missed a ride. Uh, these two people just showed up looking for your house. And Genzo looks none too pleased about this because suddenly, look, in the in the grand scheme of things, Shido and Genzo have a lot on their plate. What with this vampire daughter? And now you've just got people randomly showing up all the time asking what's up with said vampire daughter. It's a real problem. Yeah, trying to uh, keep that from the locals is uh, not exactly a very prosperous and uh, productive situation. Yeah, I mean, this is how you get people showing up at your place with, like, torches and pitchforks and stuff. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so they, they show up at the house, and once again they meet Shidu, and uh, she's like, yeah, 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 sure enough, my daughter Yuko died, you know, a about a month ago, I think, at this point. And because the, the brother has been missing for a couple of weeks as well. And uh, she says, yeah, and, and by the way, your brother did come here, but he left. He stayed for a couple of days and then he left. And, uh, you know, he's probably already home. If you go back, you're probably going to find him. And Keiko is like, all right, well, before we go, if you don't mind, I'd like to visit Keiko's grave and, and pay my respects. Wink, wink. And so she and Takagi go to the grave. And after they see this, Takagi is like, you know what? This all adds up. Your brother's probably already left. Here is this girl's grave. Let's beat it. But before they go, he takes a step and realizes that the earth on the grave is actually quite soft. Uh, suggesting it is not, you know... It, it certainly not. It's a, not a yeah, month it's, old grave. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, it's not month old hard yet. It's a lot more of a just recently tilled kind of soft. Right. And so he's like, "Uh, all right, I'm not gonna say anything to Keiko right now, uh, because I don't want to have this conversation." But Keiko notices uh, a, a like a dead bird. A bunch of dead crows with their necks all broken and bloody in the grass. And as they find, uh, as they're looking at all this, they find um, one of her brother's cufflinks in the grass also. Also potentially covered in blood. And uh, so things are suspicious around the Notamura household. And so when it comes time to leave, uh, Takagi is like, oh, I can't believe this. My car won't start. Must be a bad belt. I should have checked this uh, before we left, and I didn't. And uh, Shidu, the mother, you know, essentially says, like, hey, do you want to stay the night? And, you know, to get your car repaired. And, uh, and he and Keiko are like, yeah, yeah, that very gracious of you. Thank you very much. We'll be out of your hair very shortly. And Keiko knows right away. She's like, that fan belt is fine. You're the, you're, you're bullshitting. But I appreciate this because there is something real fishy about this. And so they have, uh, as you do in these movies, this grand dinner in the, in the dining room where uh, Shidu explains that her husband was a diplomat. And for that very reason, that's why they have this big, you know, very Western looking mansion. And, it, you know, but as with all Gothic movies, it's getting older, it's falling into disrepair and that kind of thing. And um, they're, as, as they finish up dinner, Keiko is like, hey, would you like me to follow you into the kitchen and help you with some of the dishes? And she was like, no, 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 you stay right there. Don't want you, you know, wandering around the mansion and whatnot. And 
Uh, so she leaves him alone, and that's where Keiko gives the spiel about like, look, I know you. <laughs> I know the fan belt is fine. I know that you were the one who screwed with the car, and um, but we we don't want to let on because we don't want uh, she to to think that we're trespassing. And while they're kind of chatting amongst themselves, they hear the weeping that we heard at the beginning of the, the movie, which we now know is Yuko. And so the boyfriend, Takagi, is like, you stay here. I'm going to go check on this. And so he goes to investigate. And it's another one of those great shots where he's like going down this dark hallway, you know, following this sound of, of weeping and gets to a staircase that goes down to a locked room and he's like creeping down the stairs the weeping's getting louder and then all of a sudden Shido appears and is like hello what are you doing down there and he's like oh uh nothing i uh i just heard this sound and she's like i bet you thought that was somebody weeping we get that a lot around here <laughs> and She's like, it's a skylight, and when the wind comes through the skylight in that room, it sounds like somebody weeping, but I assure you, it is, in fact, just a poorly sealed skylight. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And uh, so she also says, like, don't ever come down here again. And says that really sternly and kind of backs it up with, I'm just saying that because it's an old house and as I said, it's falling into some disrepair and you could get hurt. And so, you know, she sees him out of the stairwell and locks it, locks the door behind him to, you know, make sure that nobody goes sneaking around in there. Um, which, I don't know how many times we're, we're going to say gothic over the course of this episode, but you give me a movie that's got like a forbidden room as well like this is just ticking boxes for me every step of the way in this film yeah um i i, I can't agree anymore um hidden basements and you know spiral staircases leading down into darkened crypts and stuff like that yeah it, it's gothic for sure and uh there's absolutely no, you know you couldn't tell me that this wasn't inspired by hammer and all that other stuff from the 60s a hundred percent and all right so that night after everybody goes to bed takagi sneaks out again to start investigating around the house some more and he goes outside where he gets attacked by genzo with a big wooden club and um uh, takagi ends up you know holding his own until shidu appears and once more has to tell genzo not to murder the guests that have shown up and Takagi is like, hey, I'm sorry, I wasn't in sneak snooping around and investigating uh, the creepy disappearance of my girlfriend's brother or nothing. I, I just wanted to take a walk and clear my head, get some fresh air. And she's like, no, no, no. I should be the one to apologize. He is uh, a maniac, clearly. And while they're outside taking care of that, Keiko is looking around her room. And finds a, a, she finds this severed head. It's a, a part of a doll that her brother brought Yuko as a gift. And when she turns around, suddenly there is Yuko with her golden eyes again, holding a knife in, in a bloody hand. And when she sees this, Keiko naturally screams, which alerts Takagi and also Shidu. And they run upstairs, run into the room, and Keiko is like, you guys, Yuko was just here. And uh, Takagi is like, oh, I am so sorry. She has been quite wound up recently because of her brother being missing. Very, very sorry. Nothing will, nothing like this will happen again. And we're, we're just going to get some rest. And so that's kind of that night. And then the next morning, Keiko is like, listen, boyfriend of mine, I definitely saw Yuko. And, um, we're, but Takagi is kind of not having it. He's like, we need to get out of here. Like, the, this, 
even if there is something afoot, we need to leave. And so uh, they they drive off, and as Keiko insists on this, Hiroshi uh, Takagi is like, give me some evidence. And she, sure enough, shows him this severed head of this doll that he, he got for, uh, that her brother got for Yuko. And then they decide, all right, we're not going back to the house, but we're going to go do a little bit of, you know, go to the local library slash newspaper office and do a little investigating of our own, which is another scene I like in movies like this, where it's like, oh, let's get the secret backstory of all this. And which is what they do. They go to uh, a local uh, official of some kind to uh, look at her Yuko's death certificate to make sure she is in fact dead and he's like yeah 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 uh, she was dead like she looked beautiful when she died she it, she wasn't like beaten up and bloodied but you know part of her arm was crushed um, and, and like all the internal bleeding and the internal wounds and so forth is ultimately what uh, what, what killed her um, but as, as this official is spilling the, the tea on all this, he's like, I got to tell you, that family is just cursed. And they're like, you don't say. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, <laughs> the way he puts it is they're, they, they're cursed by the God of death. And he's like, yeah, what happened was 20 years ago, um, this vicious killer broke into uh, the house when the husband was gone and killed everybody except for the Shidu, the wife. And the uh, Genzo was spared because he was gone. And I guess the husband was killed during that, wasn't he? Now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to remember. I, I, memory fails me and I just watched this like an hour ago. I, I, I think that's when um, the, the the father d the her husband died I believe right. was like pretty similar and, yeah because I I, I I like I said I'm I'm trying to remember and I just watched this an hour and ago yeah screen. and I think they had like another kid or something like it, it's a pretty grim story and and that this murder apparently after killing all these people had his way with Shidu. And because Shidu is, you know, pregnant, and nine months later, out pops uh, Yuko. Um, but before, like after the the murder of all the, of the family, uh, Shidu tried to kill herself, and the scar that she has, it turns out, is the result of her trying to slit her own throat. And, um, but sure enough, like you know the the town doctor dr yamaguchi is the dude who you know declared everyone dead and um so they and notably declared yuko dead so they go track him down and um they ask him like hey what is yuko actually dead and he's like yes she absolutely died of all these internal injuries and so forth but then he says you know i i don't disbelieve when it comes to ghosts and they're like go on and he's like yeah i've been kind of studying the occult because when i was in the war i actually saw a guy who i knew was dead uh but he insisted that he was going to get back home and when i turned my back on him and then turned around he was standing there and you can say he was dead, but it was very clear that he, like, rose from the grave, essentially, and walked into the ocean and disappeared. And uh, he says, you know, his, his body had died, but th that need to go home survived. And he's like, you know, I know that sounds crazy coming from a doctor, but I know what I saw. And uh, yeah, um, ticking off another gothic horror uh, trope, the uh, tragic curse family. The tragic curse family, you've got, you know, the, the, this almost parlor story of an unrelated ghost sighting that happened back in the uh, in, in World War II. 
And uh, yeah, it's, oh man. It, and we haven't said this yet, but this movie is an hour and 10 minutes long. And it. J- oh, that's right. Yeah, we. Yeah, I almost forgot the time. Yeah, I almost forgot that myself because you don't even notice it. Oh yeah. Um. I mean, like I like we were saying earlier, if this doesn't grab you in the first ten minutes, you've only got an hour left, folks. Um. Yeah, this one is. It, it just zips by because not only is it just you know tons of gothic tropes, but it's only seventy minutes long. Yeah. You know, even if you know you're not invested. Even if you're not interested, it's not a bad investment. Just you know, as a quick watch. But yeah, um, no, you're totally right. I almost forgot about that myself. Yeah, and it trucks like it, there's. It's just stuffed with plot. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, the other two, they're more traditional lengths. Because those are, I those I think are like an hour and twenty or something. But yeah, no, this one barely touches seventy, if that. So. Yeah. It's. Yeah, um, it's like right. Yeah, at this it. was yeah, a. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, right. Yeah, I almost forgot that part myself. Yeah, <laughs> it's. Oh man, I mean, like if you want a bite-sized gothic bit of horror, this is your your guy. It's really good. Anyway, so they they end up leaving Doctor Yamaguchi's office, and now Keiko is like, "Look, we got to go back there. This is all too fishy." I'm almost positive that my brother, if if he's not there, they at least need, they 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 know where he is at the very least. And Takagi, uh, the the car is stopped by the side of the road as they're kind of having this discussion. And Takagi's like, "We just, I'll tell you what, let's hang out in town. We'll wait a, a little bit. We'll we'll get a plan together." And Keiko is like, "Screw that! This movie's an hour and ten minutes long. I gotta go." jumps in the car and goes back to the house and uh she just leaves him on the side of the road and then the guy who was there there was a patient in dr yamaguchi's office uh who overhears this spat leading to him being stranded and he drops this little tidbit where he's like you know the interesting thing about yuko's death is that she was never cremated because she do her her mother couldn't stand the thought of burning her and so she was actually buried and i'll tell you what if you don't think she's in that coffin i'll even help you dig the grave up for a price and sure enough that deal is struck but meanwhile keiko gets back to uh, the nonamura house and like rushes upstairs Bus open the door where Shidu uh, is is in her bedroom. Who's like, oh, did you forget something? This is the wrong room. If you did, and she's like, ha, ah, I didn't forget anything. I know that something crazy is going on. I saw Yuko last night, and she says, well, if you want to see Yuko, I can help you with that. Uh, come this way, and so she takes Keiko to this bedroom and locks her inside. So while she's in this locked bedroom, she goes to the window to try to escape that way and sees Genzo staring in at her from from out, outside. And then somebody else comes in the room, not Yuko, but Dr. Yamaguchi. And he says, hey, uh, Shidu called me because you busted into her room talking all crazy. And so I'm just here to help you. And I'm going to give you a sedative to calm you down a little bit and so they basically tie her to the bed restrain her with cuffs to the bed and then he gives her a sedative and she gets knocked out so which <clears throat> i know that uh, it's probably a stretch to think that this was a um uh, a, an inspiration but it reminded me a lot of the bit from salem's lot where barlow uh not barlow uh straker um knocks out the you know the bonnie bedelia character if you're talking about the movie sue her sue norton that's the character's name knocks her out and leaves her for barlow to find and it's that kind of thing of like we're gonna we're going to sedate keiko strap her down to this bed and come tonight then yuko has her her next meal yeah, kind of. I mean, it, 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 
it little it kind of just falls apart just because Salem's Lot is 79 and this one's 1971 so sure I, I, yeah um, I, I get where you're coming from I mean the idea is uh, technically there um, maybe you know it could actually be that Salem's Lot took their inspiration from this one right yeah yeah but right. yeah, yeah. yeah um, I yeah there's a there's a certain parallel there yeah I can see that so night falls on the estate and Takagi and his gravedigger pal uh, essentially dig up Yuko's grave. And, um, you know, he's like, look, I know you paid me already, but let me assure you, Yuko is 100% dead. I can, I can tell you that much because, like, that car accident really happened. And he, the gravedigger finally gets the, the coffin open and... Um, he's like, all right, I'm going to open this, but don't blame me when we open this up and there's a disgusting corpse in here. But instead, there is apparently a mannequin on a spring in this coffin. Because <laughs> as soon as the lid pops open, <laughs> yeah. this body flies out of it. And uh, remember, folks, uh, this is uh, still in the ground, so it's still horizontal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the spring-loaded corpses. <laughs> and so the gravedigger gets hit by the this, you know, giant doll, freaks out and goes running. Uh, Takagi, keeping his wits about him, uh, realizes like, oh, this isn't an actual corpse. This is, in fact, some kind of mannequin. But unfortunately, our gravedigger pal runs right into Yuko, who uh, gets him. And uh, Hiroshi hears the dude scream, so Hiroshi uh, goes running after the grave digger and finds him dead on the ground with his throat open and blood everywhere, which is pretty good. One of the, the few times we get like a direct look at Yuko's handiwork. Yeah, it's uh, much more atmospheric than um, a lot of the other kind of like gore films that you, you would probably expect them from Japan. So yeah, um, uh, being one of the few gore scenes, it, it does kind of leave like a small little shock when you see it, just because you're not expecting it to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it still looks you know distinctly 70s. So I mean, anybody that's familiar with like giallo aftermath or violence like that, it's not going to be phased by it. But the fact that it's been so so moody and so like reserved in that um, area until then seeing it does leave a bit of a shock just because it you're right it is you know like the first instances of like real carnage and blood that we've seen in the film till this point so yeah um it, it's certainly effective but um you know if you're looking at it from a technical standpoint anybody that's seen like a giallo murder or two is going to be like oh yeah i know exactly what that looks like but still um point taken yeah it, it's pretty good and uh so Takagi sees uh, Yuko running off and chases after her, but sure enough, Genzo comes back for round two, and they tussle some more, uh, except this time Genzo doesn't have a club. He's got a hatchet, uh, which gets stuck in a tree, and ultimately Genzo uh, it starts choking Takagi, but Takagi throws him over the side of a cliff that they're wrestling at the edge of. And uh, sure enough, he looks over the edge and there's, you know, Genzo's broken body lying on the rocks at the bottom of this cliff. So now Genzo is uh, Dunzo, I think is how the script probably read. Wouldn't be and, surprised. And so Takagi then goes back to the house and asks Shidu, like, hey, where's Keiko? I know she was coming back here. Also, I definitely saw Yuko, and FYI, I also kind of killed your guy Genzo. And at this point, we get the full reveal of what the story of, of you know, the vampire doll kind of is, which is, oh yeah, Yuko, you did see Yuko, but she's dead. It's just that her anger is still here, like her angry soul still exists here. And the problem, like, basically she was the product of a rape that happened, you know, during this murder. And so she grew up being called 
the you know the child of a killer all her her childhood and the one moment where she was about to achieve happiness where she was going to marry Sagawa that she has this accident and dies and you know she was crying out for Sagawa the one person who brought her happiness after all these years of, of suffering and that she refused to die until she saw her lover again. And so her mother was like, look, I'm not going to let her die in this state. And so I didn't. And I got our pal Yamaguchi to hypnotize her at the point of her death so that she did not die essentially. But that resulted in her becoming a vampire who is not dead but now has to seek blood at night to survive during the day she's kind of herself a little bit and so when we saw her before where she's like crying like all the weeping is her understanding that she needs to die and kind of wanting to die but as soon as night falls and the you know vampiric hunger awakens inside her she gets the golden eyes and starts murdering again and uh so when takagi is like why haven't you freed her from this she's like well it, it has to be done by the person who hypnotized her and i was not that person it turns out that dr yamaguchi is the guy who hypnotized her and then we get the part b of that story which is that Yamaguchi was, in fact, the killer. That he uh, was uh, engaged to Shidu at one point and then went off to the war and then lost everything. Like, by the time he got back, she had already married again and started this other family. And so that's why he murdered him. And as he's telling this story, he's kind of putting the mojo on Takagi and hypnotizing him and he says so you know i killed her husband i killed the family that she was starting and then once i realized she was pregnant i hung out in town so i could watch my child grow up and uh so i it's it's a very convoluted story but it makes, I guess, a certain kind of sense? Yeah, um, some of it kind of falls a little flat. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, he spends the entire time doing this while, she, you know, Shidu is very aware that he's the one that killed her. Because, yeah, yeah. And like, you know, she, you know, she's aware that he's the one that was responsible for the death of her husband and her kids. Or at least the film makes it seem like she's aware the entire time. So why she never rats him out as the one that was responsible for these deaths just kind of... That that part of it remains a mystery. But the, the idea of him trying to stay around to make sure that the daughter... You know, because like we've, like we've been saying, Yuko is actually his. So the idea yeah. that he would want to see his daughter... Um, that part of it, I, I guess, would make sense. But, you know, it, it, you still have the other whole aspect of Shiru is aware that Dr. Yamagata is the one that killed her killed her husband and her kids. Why is, she, you know, why is he not behind bars for these murders? It, right. It's a fine question. I mean, you can fall back to some degree on the idea of the kind of, you know, this was shiru's daughter as well and didn't like she was already getting a hard time for being the child of a murderer and maybe you know and, and she was she was engaged to the guy at yeah, one that, time i mean you know yeah there is something to be said for you know still wanting to be you know you, you still have your first love i mean that er, there is something to be said for that but even if that was the case you know there's still you know the idea of one why isn't he not responsible? Why isn't he you know, in jail for the murders? And if she, if he killed the family to prove his love for her, why didn't him and Shidu get back together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not wrong. Like, I th this completely falls apart in cross examination. But 
Um, yeah, I don't know why she covered for him. And the implication is obviously that Yuko does not ever know. Right, any of yeah. This. And which leads to our conclusion. Which, by the way, if you're keeping score at home, ladies and jelly spoons, about 10 minutes of this movie left at this point. And so while uh, poor Takagi is getting hypnotized by Yamaguchi, Keiko has come to, gets out of her room, and goes down the staircase that, you know, we saw earlier in the movie uh, where Shidu was like, don't ever go down those steps. Well, that's where she's going. And finds this door at the bottom of the stairs and looks through it to see... Yuko lying on a bed, apparently unconscious, and sees who she thinks, and is not incorrect, her brother in a chair beside this bed. And so Keiko gets the door open, turns the chair around, and sees her brother who's got, I guess, a rotten corpse face is the idea, that he's just been left dead in this room the whole time. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, I'm still not entirely sure of it myself, but I, that was my guess. I think that, like, he doesn't look like a corpse, really, yeah, but he's definitely yeah, not a vampire. Yeah, because he, there, there, it's a different makeup job than what we've seen on, um, on Yuko f beforehand, and, I, I again, I, I see how this just an hour ago, and I'm trying to compare the, the makeup job on him against, um, the gardener that got the throat cut out. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's definitely not vampire makeup for sure, but yeah, it, it's not exactly, you know, like the exact same makeup job on corpse body that you have um, here. So, yeah, um, I, I think that was the idea, but I don't know if it was just, you know, a, an ill-conceived makeup job or they were going for something else. But, I mean, corpse makes the most sense in the scene, so I'm probably guessing that was the way they were they were trying to go. Yeah, I... Yeah, I think that's the case right. so at, at any rate um but keiko sees the screams which wakes up yuko who is like oh feeding time and she gets the golden eyes again which is a terrific effect i really really like this effect and uh so that wakes up uh uh takagi you know kind of shakes him out of the hypnotism where he's like oh my god keiko's screaming and so he fights off Yamaguchi, runs to Keiko, and before they can get out, Yamaguchi uh, stops them by firing a pistol. And he's like, all right, everybody cut the shit for a second. You are not escaping. I haven't had to use this pistol since the war, but it's still got a few bullets in it. And uh, he's like, he's like, look, I'm way too close. I, the way he puts it is, I, I, there was no way I could miss at this range. So if you try to run, I'm going to shoot you. And before he can take care of Keiko and Takagi, Yuko comes in the room with a knife. And he starts to tell her, like, oh, I'm going to reveal that I'm her father. But before he can even get the words out of his mouth, she cuts his throat and kills him and the spray of blood that comes out of this wound is evil dead mm, to -esque. yeah um i think this was probably where they were saving a lot of their uh, special effects um budget for because yeah um it, it is a fantastic spray that uh yeah, I mean, you, like we said, um, the earlier uh, neck wound uh, shock effect it works because you haven't seen anything else. And then this goes ahead and then it one-ups that. And it is a fantastic yeah. look. I, I love that sequence. It's it's not quite like a Tokyo Gore Police level of blood. Right, it's not, a, it's not comedic but, looking. I think that's the thing is that it, it's not yeah. played as like a comedic over-the-top kind of a splatstick kind of arterial spray it's more like she hit a she hit an actual vein and it just erupts yeah it, it's very good and because she has now murdered the guy that hypnotized her the spell is broken yuko collapses to the ground and uh her you know 
golden eyes are gone. Her face and and hand starts to get all corpsey and and you know collapse on itself. And uh, and that's kind of it. Then like she do like kneels beside beside her and cries while Keiko and Takagi are like, well, I guess it's over. Yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of like I mean, one of those just. Um, you know, if you've seen like a lot of those, you know, Shaw Brothers films where they just end, it's like, you know, two seconds after the main villain's defeated, it's like, well, that's done, time to go. And then it's just kind of like, bam, credits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're done here, um, which I love. Like, yes, this story is over. We, we, we have accomplished our goal of telling this story. We're done. Uh, end of movie. And, uh, yeah, and so that's it, all 70 minutes of it. And so let's talk about this cast a little bit. Um, it's starting with Yukiko Kobayashi, who plays Yuko, the, the vampire of the movie. Um, she is really creepy when she needs to be while still being very loved. Yeah, um, I, I think it's that Asian quality where she kind of has that demure quality. You know, she doesn't speak hardly anything. But, you know, she has kind of that innocent look to her where she's like luring victims. Like, where she, you see her out on the castle grounds and she has that look where she's kind of like trying to allure people to like get them like off guard. But then, you know, yeah, the the, the makeup, what they do with her eyes, uh, that golden eye look is just fantastic. And it, having her hair kind of like drape over her face and that J-horror look, ugh, it's fantastic. It, it It's pretty chilling when you first see her like that. Yeah, you may or may not recognize the lovely Yukiko uh, Kobayashi from Destroy All Monsters, which is a banger. Uh, also Space oh, Amoeba. Yeah just the year before and and then you know a bunch of other movies and tv and stuff but those are the the two big ones uh she's terrific loved her in this um you've got yoko minakaze as she do the mother um she is the, the like you know that prim matriarch kind of character and she's really great in this um atsuo nakamura who plays uh sagawa the the brother who uh, ends up with the corpse face. Um, he's not in it a ton, but he, he's totally good in this. Um, Kayo Matsuo, who plays Keiko, who is maybe my favorite thing in this movie. Could yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I really like her. Um, she's a lot more fun. Uh, she has more of a Western, like, go-getter attitude than you would normally see from, like, an Asian female at this time. And yeah, it, it really fits the kind of film. I was I was gonna bring her up if you didn't mention it, because yeah, um, I, I really like her. She's assertive. She you know takes charge. Um, she does kind of become like that simpering female, you know, hiding in the corner when you know Kate when Yuko kind of appears as a vampire form. But for the most part, yeah, she leads the story. She takes charge. She kind of bosses um, Sagawa around, mm -hmm. and she's not afraid to stand up to Shino to uh, Shindu. So. Yeah, um, she has a little bit more of like a Western flair to her, um, which kind of fits being that it's so Western influenced. But yeah, uh, I'm really glad you you said that too, because I, I really like her as well. Yeah, she's really, really good. And uh, a shout out to uh, Akira Nako, who uh, plays her boyfriend Takagi in this, who... Oh, 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 yeah, I know exactly where you're going with this, because... Yeah, he's the uh, general that you see in all of the Heizai Godzilla films. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Godzilla vs. Yeah. Godzilla 2, Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, God Godzilla vs. Destroya, Tokyo SOS, yeah. Final Wars. He's in all of them. Yeah, he's the uh, general. Yeah, he's either the general or um, one of the you know defense forces you know ministers, whatever. Mm -hmm one is appropriate for the story yeah you see him as a young kind of spry kind of um yeah he's like younger and spry in this instead of you know decked out in a military costume but oh yeah i i knew exactly who he was when i first saw him yeah it, can't miss that face yeah, yeah. and he i mean th their their relationship is a lot of fun because it's clearly like you said it's almost strangely western but then again that was sort of the marching order of this movie was to do a very western style of film and 
they did a good job of, of creating that that dynamic of like you've got um you know Keiko who as you said is a little bit more of a you know go getter has a lot more spunk and gumption or whatever you want to call it um and yeah it's it's really good um also worth pointing out Junio Osami who is Yamaguchi uh who was in um a bunch of TV but I kind of know him from the movie Tora 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 which was uh an American film which had like Jason Robards and uh, Martin Balsam and uh, who else? Joseph Cotton, E.G. Marshall, like just a World War II film, and uh, yeah. he was in that as well. So, um, you know, like really storied actors in the in this movie. Um, like Toho took it seriously. This was not a cheapo movie by any stretch. Like the you know Toho was trying to make a good movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can just tell immediately from the set design that this was not just going to be some, like, campy, quick, just, you know, rush something out to get a product out kind of a film. I mean, you can just tell from that point there that this wasn't, you know, this was going to be like a, maybe not like a blockbuster kind of a thing, but this was definitely something that they took pride in and there was a real craft put into this kind of film. So, yeah, um, the fact that nobody's really like a hammy kind of an actor, nobody's really kind of like, you know playing larger than their kind of role or like you know really standing out but they're you know they have like a much more grounded serious reaction to everything you can definitely tell that this was kind of a much more serious product yeah and um so all right let's get to kind of themes and final thoughts here um i would say thematically this is a very like you know the secrets of uh of the past coming to haunt the present and the idea of the corrupt family and very again very gothic horror kind of tropes um and also uh i i think a healthy dose of the extremes that you go to for your family you know the stuff that she does for right. her daughter and and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like I mean, like we were saying earlier, the entire thing is Yamagata trying to make sure that he's there to make sh to be around the daughter that he can be around his daughter and see her grow up. So him concocting this entire plan to murder off everybody around him and make sure that he, you know, his daughter is the only one that's around. So there's no competition. There's n you know nothing else that you know would stand in the way of her being who he wants her to be. I mean, you can easily see that as like the primary factor for everything. Cause even still, he's the one that hypnotizes her and turns her into a vampire to keep her alive in order to make sure that she continues living. So I, you, you could absolutely say for a fact that this is definitely, you know, how far would you go for the one you loved kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you've already mentioned this, but just to reemphasize this, Oh my goodness, the sets in this movie, the the atmosphere, like this is, you know, yes, it's aping the Hammer films, but it gets it right, you know, like it's a right, good yeah. impression of those movies. And it turns out that if you, if you just get close to the vibe of a Hammer movie, um, you're in pretty good territory. And then you have all the sort of like that that layer of kind of Japanese weirdness, because exactly yeah, I mean the 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 whole idea of Japan doing European Gothic just seems weird, but you know by virtue of their geography alone. But then the whole thing is you know this is ten years after Hammer. Because, you know, Hammer started, you know, 57, Curse of Frankenstein, Horror of Dracula, you know, Mummy, Revenge of Frankenstein, all that stuff. That's 57, 58. You know, this is a whole decade later. And not only that, but, you know, like we were saying earlier, the geographical differences between, you know, Hammer in the UK and, you know, Toho Studios in Japan. So the very fact that you would that you're trying to mesh these two factors together is weird enough on its own. But the other thing, too, is that because you're playing with, you know, 
you're playing with European influences, it's very Western compared to how traditional Japanese ghost stories would be at the time. You look at, you know, a lot more, you know, localized flair like, you know, Kwaidan or Onibaba or, you know, Kuraniko. You know, those would, you know, like contemporary stories to this film here. It's far more westernized in tone and feel and atmosphere and delivery than what you would get in, you know, localized product. So there's just this odd disconnect in your head to where, you know, are you really watching like a Japanese film? Are you watching, you know, is this secretly a Hammer film that was just shot in Japan with your with Japanese actors? Like it, you know, I'm, it it just has like this weird dissonance in your head that it's kind of weird to wrap your head around. But I think when you do, you can easily have just a ball with this film. And yeah, yeah, uh, the, it, it really works on just so many levels. All right. Well, uh, speaking of having a ball with it, so uh, let's review or not just review this thing. Let's rate this thing. And uh, as always, we do one to five stars. Half stars are allowed. No quarter stars because we're not monsters here. Um, right. So, like, where do you land with this thing ultimately? Altogether, um, this is a, a really, really fun film. Um, we've mentioned it's fast paced. There's very little lulls in it. The atmosphere is impeccable. The professionalism, the care, the attention to detail, it gets all of that right. Um, it, the plot kind of falls apart under um, very, very, very minimal scrutiny. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, you can kind of uh, poke a little bit of holes into, you know, the entire reasoning why he's, you know, why Yamagata is doing what he's doing. You know why Shindu is putting up with everything. You know that kind of stuff. Kind, you know, you can very easily, you know, uh, scrutinize that. Um, you know, if you're not into gothic horror, you know, you're you're not you're probably you may be bored um, just because there's atmosphere and tension, but there's no real action until the end. So. I, I'm leaning between a very, very strong four and a weak four and a half. Um, I, I, I'm probably going to say the very strong four. Yeah, that's exactly where I land with it, too, for almost the same reasons, which is I love everything about this movie, except once you start picking at the plot, you're like, well, oh, wait a second now. Um but it just it just drips with that great atmosphere and by the time you get to the end where you're really starting to kind of scratch your head and figure out like what now what happened with why is she doing this and this is all because she was hypnotized not to die um that it's still such a good time that it may not be perfect but by god for 70 minutes you were going to be wildly entertained if you like you said i think if you've ever seen a hammer movie and really enjoyed it then you owe yourself uh to to seek out the vampire doll which yeah these days i think you can watch this on tubi even so yeah i i i think all three of them are on there um i've I, I know I've seen the uh, trilogy set um, and Barnes and Noble for you know Arrow half off sales, so um, I I don't know if they will have the slipcover, but um, I'm almost positive you can pick this up at like a Barnes and Noble or any kind of like reputable sales force that does like half off Arrow sales for like thirty bucks if you wait for it. So yeah, um, I, I I know the sets. I know they're. Oh, the three of them, um, which would be this one, um, Evil of Dracula and Lake of Dracula, mm -hmm. or maybe it's the other way around. I think I, I think Evil's the third one. Yeah, that that's the yeah, capo. Yeah, the yeah, Lake is second, uh, Evil's third. Um, brain fart there. Yeah, the, um, they're available on Tubi, or um, you can, like I said, pick up the set at like a half off arrow sale for thirty bucks or somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah. Or if you're a weirdo like me and have a subscription to the Arrow streaming service, oh, there, yeah, there you go. You, um, you can perfect, yeah. You can get all three, and they're they're really nice transfers. Um, 
All right, well, th before I let you loose here, Don, here are three facts that you may or may not know about uh, about the vampire doll. One, and we've, we've kind of talked about this, but all of this came from the fact that Toho was having some financial troubles towards the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s, and they were like, all right, so let's do another horror movie, and let's do one of them Hammer movies. And uh, the producer, Fumio Tanaka, w basically said, Let, we're going to do Dracula for Japan. And, and specifically reference like the Christopher Lee Hammer Dracula movies. But Michio Yamamoto, the guy who directed the movie, was like, eh, that's not really what I want to do. I want to do something that's more of a thriller and not just, you know, a carbon copy horror movie. And so when they were doing the the script for this it really was a blend and kind of a tension between those two ideas of let's do a hammer movie and uh and and, and uh, michio yamamoto saying eh, i don't really want to do a hammer movie i want to do something that's more of a mystery thriller and so that's where you get all of this like creeping around and hidden doors and all that stuff and I really think that it's that tension between those two ideas that really makes the movie work. Yeah, I do too. Um, if there was like a, if there was a Christopher Lee kind of a Dracula figure in this, I, I don't know if it works as well as it does. Um, the idea of trying to figure out who she really is, what, you know, what the scythings are all about, what the strange noises are. I think that plays a lot more, it plays a lot better than, you know, if there was, you know, uh, Keiko and Sagawa trying to figure out what kind of vampire they're dealing with. Um, I, I, I think it works a lot better just with the uh, discovery of what's going on in the, you know, the central mystery angle. Ah, speaking of the central mystery angle, number two on our list of things you may or may not know, um, Fumio Tanaka, the producer we were just talking about, when they were developing the story, one of the big inspirations was... The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar, a, an Edgar Allan Poe story that also has elements of bringing people back from the dead through hypnosis. So even though that seems like a weird oddball kind of feature, it is strangely another Western influence on this movie, just not Hammer, but Edgar Allan Poe. That fits. I mean, yeah, there, there was actually a feature in... Um... A Vincent Price anthology from like the 60s. I think it's either Twice Told Tales or that other one he did. That, that There was an adaptation of that where a person was hypnotized at the moment of their death and it prevented them from dying, but their spirit lingered on kind of a thing. Yeah, there mm -hmm. was an. I remember that. I remember seeing that as an adaptation. Of, I, I know Vincent Price is um, in that one there. I, I don't remember which one it was. But yeah, um, I would not at all be surprised to to have heard that. Um, saying it makes sense, but um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that that would be an influence. And finally, just a quick note about the contacts that uh, were used for Yuko in the film. Um, because of the technology of contacts at the time, there was no way uh, for the poor actress to see through these contacts. And so one of the reasons that she moves kind of awkwardly when she is uh, in this state is because she was completely unable to see anything and so lar largely had to go off of the direction. And uh, so you can think uh, those completely outdated scleral contact lenses for some of the creep factor of uh, Yuko's you know, sort of tentative and staggered motions of the movie, which were basically just so she wouldn't fall down. I mean, yeah, um, I, I, I've heard stories about, you know, contact lenses being like so, you know, so uncomfortable and so improper to see out of that, you know, people are literally walking on stage blind. So I wouldn't at all be mm -hmm. surprised to have heard that. I mean, you know, again, it's another one of those I wouldn't have made the connection, but now saying it, it makes sense. Yep, well, you know, we try to be at least somewhat informative, uh, as well as, uh, you know, a through line for the Silk Road on the dark web. Uh, but that's a different thing. Um, 
look, that is uh, the Vampire Doll. Uh, as we talked about, please, if you haven't checked it out, uh, you you really should. If you're especially if you're a fan of Gothic horror, there are two more of these, uh, often referred to as the Bloodthirsty Trilogy, as Don said, uh, Lake of Dracula and Evil Evil of Dracula. Uh, both are worth your time, uh, as is this one. But uh, Vampire Doll is the most oddball of the three like the the other two and and uh the director was brought back for both of those yeah. films but those feel much more like straight ahead kind of vampire movies yeah um i i i would probably even say that um in terms of like a dracula influence there's a much bigger influence especially in part two where there's almost like a legitimate carbon copy of it yeah yeah um but that being said, still really fun movies, and and the atmosphere is still there as well. So uh, it's a it's a real good time. Um, but Don, one last thing uh, before you go, please tell people again where they can hear more out of you uh, before I finally let you loose into uh, you know the the general public, the the gin pop as they call uh, it. All right. So um, you can find me on a show called uh, Normal Room in Hell Presents Fresh Cuts, or just affectionately known as Fresh Cuts. Um, we are a weekly show that looks at the biggest release of the current week, whether it be uh, streaming, VOD, theatrical, whatever. Um, you can also find me on uh, Normal Room in Hell Presents Creature Comforts, which uh, Bo is intimately familiar with, being a guest on Mm -hmm. uh, both of those are available on uh, the Dark Discussions Network, or uh, you can find it on uh, the No More Room in Hell feed. Uh, they're not uh, separate feeds uh, in p most podcatchers. Um, you subscribe to the No More Room in Hell feed, you get access to both of those shows. So um, you would you 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 do better to do um, the No More main No More Room in Hell feed. Um, I also do a uh, kaiju show um, discussing Godzilla, Gamera, and other giant monsters um, known as uh, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. Um, that one there can be found on uh, the lovely uh, Legion podcast or under uh, the Kill the Cast feed. Same principle, we don't have a separate um, feed for um, Underwater Kaiju. You need either the Legion feed or the Kill the Cast feed in order to gain access and um, lastly, the main show, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, beginning of this uh, little rundown here, the Horror Countdown Podcast, which is top ten list. Uh, that one there you can find on uh, as its own separate show on uh, just about every catcher out there. I think I've got it on most systems, and I haven't heard anybody complain that they haven't been able to find it. So uh, apparently, I did my job and got it out there. So. Um, it's, uh, like I said, it's top 10 lists. It's not reviews. It's not, um, anything else. It's just me and a guest sitting down, picking a topic and, uh, counting down from there. So multiple of ways, uh, to find me. Um, like I said, uh, you know, a couple feeds that, uh, you have to, uh, subscribe to a main show in order to get access, but, um, it's out there, uh, for those that want to find me. Excellent, man. Uh, thank you, as always, for doing this. I'm, I'm so glad we got to talk some, some Asian horror together. And, uh, yeah, uh, I'll be right back to close out the show. Well, thanks for having me. Arigato. <laughs> and there you have it. That is my talk with Don and Ellie about The Vampire Doll, a movie that we both clearly very much enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. I hope you seek out the movie. It is uh, pretty wild and really fun. Uh, surprisingly Western, as was its intention, so no surprises there. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, if you are a Hero Hero Go Show subscriber and are listening on that feed, uh, like I said, please uh, subscribe to The Dark Parade, where you will continue to get more Asian horror on a semi-regular basis, certainly more regular than it has been, and, uh, and, and something that I will, uh, of course, continue to pursue uh, we will probably be doing the other two films in the uh, the vampire series, uh, Lake of Dracula and Evil of Dracula. Is that what it is? Um, I forget now that I am not steeped in the research for the episode, but one of them. 
you know, there's a, a Dracula running around in, in that uh, movie. So we'll uh, we'll continue down that series as well at some point, uh, as well as, uh, you know, I'll probably drop in some Godzilla stuff here and there. Uh, I've been kind of itching to get back to uh, discussing those movies, so a lot of stuff coming. And uh, like I said, if you're a subscriber to Hero Hero Go Show, please seek out the Dark Parade where you will be sure to get all of the new stuff as well. And for those of you listening on the Dark Parade feed, uh, which is most of yous, then uh, thanks for, uh, again, sharing and, and you know, being part of this community. Uh, if you want to continue to uh, have conversations about these movies, you can do so on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade. You can also hit me up on Twitter at dark parade pod. Uh, if you have any recommendations of a place to uh, have this conversation in a way that doesn't tie you to some corporate overlord like Facebook, uh, drop me a line at bo, B O at legion podcasts.com. And uh, you can also request movies there. Our listener request month, by the way, all done. Uh, next month, we are going to be kicking off a new series, uh, which is a little mini series, uh, in fairness, on The Gate and The Gate 2. One, because I think The Gate is a fascinating movie, and I think The Gate 2 is such an oddball sequel that I'm really looking forward to discussing both of those films. And that will be coming the first two weeks of March, and then, of course, more on the other side of that, including a little bit of Shion Sono. We're going to get back to uh, some of that uh, on uh, on the Dark Parade. And uh, yeah, so lots of stuff coming. Thanks again uh, for listening. Thanks for rating and reviewing where that's possible. Thanks for spreading the word. Uh, if you know somebody interested in a horror podcast that hopefully is a little more substantive uh, than most of the fair out there, then uh, please uh, send them our way. And, uh, and lastly, uh, just a big thank you as always for joining us on the dark parade. We'll see you next time. <laughs>